So it's actually not a paper based on my dissertation. It's actually like the gist of my dissertation, which I submitted yesterday. So it, it was very fast in putting together. So I apologize. Um, so I will start just with my main takeaways because, you know, so I study the conflict transformation process in Northern Ireland and I focus solely on the provisional Irish Republican movement. And I treat them as a dual wing resistance organization, which I will explain. So my, I have three points that I would like to make. One of them is that we understand what these dual wings resistance organizations are. The second thing is to show that these dual wings can adopt one of four strategic choices when they interact with other actors in the conflict. Um, and then I offer some sort of a new uh, framework of analysis that is based on uh, levels of analysis. I look into whatever is happening in the context, whatever is happening within the organization, and whatever is going on with the leadership to explain when the movement chooses one behavior over another. Um, my point is that we have to look into all the levels um, in order to understand the strategic choices that actors in conflict transformation processes make. Um, and that we have to look into the way the different factors from the different levels actually interact with each other and affect, affect however the movement is acting. So my initial question was how do conflicts actually get transformed? But then I moved to more particular questions which are when do these dual wing resistance organizations, and for now we're just gonna talk about the Republican movement, so when do they converge around violent, violence? When do they converge around nonviolence? And when do they actually diverge? Because I found that when you have two wings, sometimes each wing is doing something else. So the organization as a whole is not sending a unified message. So I was interested in, learn, in learning what are the factors that actually push these organizations to act in one way over another? And can I find patterns over time um, with, within the conflict that will show, oh, when these things happen, we see an organization that is more violent. When these things happen, it pushes the organization to diverge. So I was interested in learning how does that happen. I have a bunch of guiding hypotheses which are more like my questions. Um, I started with, um, so I really like the conflict transformation literature. I started, so I come with a background of terrorism studies and more civil war related studies and then I stumbled upon the conflict transformation. It's more, like you said, it's very holistic. It may, may be too holistic, but I found that it actually makes a lot of good points that terrorism scholars are missing. So my goal in my dissertation was basically to bring all these points of views from terrorism, from civil wars, from social movements, from conflict resolution and to see how they are in fact talking about the same phenomena but not talking to each other. So they're missing a lot of the benefits of whatever the others are saying. So the first thing is that the conflict transformation is a process and because it's a process, it doesn't help us if we focus only on single snapshots. It doesn't help us to, to study the Good Friday Agreement if we can't understand what led us to the Good Friday Agreement. It doesn't help us to study the Oslo Accords if we didn't look into what were the steps that led to that place. So I think that we should look into the process as a whole. Um, another thing that, is, uh, that I found about conflict transformation processes is that they are far from linear in the sense that if I focus on the Republican movement, it doesn't go from contention to cooperation in a linear way. It didn't start being violent and ended one day being nonviolent um, linearly. It went back and forth between different stages of cooperation and contention, which is also not dichotomous, right? Like, it's not, there are various levels of contention and there are various levels of cooperation. And the point in this is that I think we should actually emphasize and give credit to movements who are prone to violence when they make these little, when they give these little signals of actually cooperating, which sometimes may not seem like a big deal, but for them it is a big deal. Um, 
So I gathered factors. I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, um, and my hypothesis was that there is no factor that I can look at that will explain all of the behaviors, right? I can't look at the British government and say, oh, when the British government does this, then obviously the Republican movement will do this because it's, it doesn't work that way. So no one factor will explain all the types of behaviors. No one level of analysis will explain all type of behaviors. We cannot just focus on the context or the environment of the conflict, political opportunity structures as we call them in competitive politics because that still doesn't help us understand the choices between contention and cooperation. It helps, but it's not the entire story. So we have to look into organizational dynamics and into leaderships. On their own, no level will actually explain all the behaviors. I did, however, uh, thought that specific factors will have more of an explanatory value um, than other factors for a specific type of behaviors. So when the movement is, um, is converging around violence, I suspected that the British government will have more to do with that than it did with other behaviors. Um, at the end of the day, the, the strategic choice a movement uh, makes is determined by the interaction between different factors at different levels of analysis. And without looking into that interaction, we can't make sense of organizational decisions. Because similar behaviors can, are driven by different organizational goals. So terrorism studies talk about how terrorist organizations, um, they, their main goal is survival, right? So a lot of their decision making is based on the fact that they need to survive. They need to prevent organizations from splintering. So they will take actions. So leaders who are opposed to violence will agree to some violence if they fear that their organization is about to splinter. So some of the decisions organizations make are driven by this need of survival, but other decisions they make are driven by different organizational goals. Um, so even when they act in the same way, they are driven by different organizational goals. And if we don't look into organizational dynamic, we won't understand that. Um, finally, leaders play a very central role role in pushing these organizational um, decisions. So um, I define dual wing resistance organizations. There's not a lot of work on these. There's some, there's uh, Perligel, Pedetsu, and Weinberg. They have a book from 2009 about uh, when do terrorist organizations adopt a political party and when political parties will adopt a terrorist organization. Um, there's the work of Benedetta Alberti from Tel Aviv University, who talks um, also about these. Um, and then there's a bunch of game theory models that talk about this. But all in all, I think it did not receive a lot of attention in the literature. For me, they are resistance movements that employ both violent and nonviolent tactics and sustain a military wing that is at least on paper separate from a political or social wing. And the, the distinction is very important. So I see the Republican movement as building on two separate wings. Some people don't agree with that. Uh, I've met a bunch of people who don't agree with that, but I see them as two separate wings. Um, and there's enough evidence to show that even though they, um, they have several leaders that are shared between the wings. And even though they have the same organizational goals, they are still two wings with a shared uh, end goal, but different ways to get to that goal. Um, so the military wing will use armed um, resistance, whereas the political wing will use cooperative, um, we'll call it, um, measures, right? So. What I did was I looked into the conflict in Northern Ireland from the day Jerry Adams became the president of the Sinn Féin, which was in November 1983. Um, he was very central to the conflict even before he became the president. But um, because I want to see how he behaved as president, uh, he is the starting point. Because um, that is when he becomes the official spokesperson for the movement. Before that. He was just a person in the movement. So what I did was I looked into the, the conflict 
from the day he became the president until the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And granted, the Good Friday Agreement is not the end of the conflict. Um, many people in Northern Ireland will claim that the conflict is not done, uh, it's not over, but it doesn't change the fact that the violence has been reduced significantly. Um, so that's a good enough point for me to stop. So the conflict has transformed. It may not have ended, but it has transformed. And for me, that was the point. So how do we get to that transformation? So I found, I focused on the Republican movement, and I found 24 cases of behaviors of the movement in which in 10 of these cases, both wings, IRA and Sinn Féin, are acting in cooperative manner, meaning that the IRA, for 10 times in the conflict, was sending positive signals to its adversaries that were just not being picked up. But it was doing positive things that should have um, been noticed, right? So we have 10 cases of convergent cooperation, three cases of convergent violence, and granted, there were many more cases of convergent violence in the period before Adams came to power. But once he came to power, he slowly and incrementally managed to push the movement away. Um, the more interesting cases are the eight cases of divergent behavior in which the organization was incapable of overcoming organizational um, dynamics or unwilling to overcome organizational um, preference divergence, as they're called, in which at the same time the IRA is being violent and the Sinn Féin is saying we want peace at the same time. So, and then we have three cases where the IRA in itself is communicating with the British, is sending the British um, pointers for negotiation while bombing Heathrow Airport. So, how can you explain these split personalities for one organization? Um, so over time, I said the conflict is nonlinear, right, the process. So over time, from 1983 to 1998, um, we, have, we switch from violence, violence, cooperation, cooperation, divergence, cooperation, violence, divergence. It keeps changing. So they keep sending all these messages. So how do you know what is going on? So what I did was I looked first into the context. I gathered all these literatures that say that this is the most important thing to understand conflict, or this is the most important thing. So I found that in terms of context, we should look at the government. We should look at agreements that have been signed. We should look at, in this case, the unionists, the loyalists, the other side. We should look into what ever the Irish Republic was doing at the time. We should look into elections. We should look into intermediaries. We should look into spoilers, all these terms, right, from conflict transformation. Um, I have a special one, which is called promoters of peace, which is people who are far more than just intermediaries, um, but are still invested in the, um, they have a, an interest in the conflict, right? In this case specifically, John Hume is my main promoter of peace. He gets, well, he got a Nobel Prize, so he can get his own label, right? Um, but it actually uh, um, relates to some other people um, who served as go-betweens, betweeners between Jerry Adams and the British. What I did was I mapped everything that was happening for each case over four months, what was happening in four months before the case, before the behavior I'm studying, and then I analyzed from the point of view of the Republican movement, was this a positive thing for me or a negative thing for me? Was this um, increasing my, chance, my, my chances to voice my contention with the system or is this decreasing my ability to voice my contention? Um, so for what I find, found is, I'll, I'll be quick because I don't want to see. I'll be very quick. Um, what I found basically is that in most cases, in most cases, the context can actually explain several of the behaviors. Um, so when the context is, I won't force you to count, but when the context is more positive than negative, then the IRA, uh, Sinn Féin, have more of an incentive to actually send cooperative signs and not go against the system. 
Whereas when the context is more negative than positive, then it doesn't have an incentive to relinquish violence at the time. But more interestingly is when the context is equally as positive as it is negative, meaning that the British government or the Irish government are sending mixed signals themselves, then you cannot be surprised that the organization that you are trying to make, to make them seize violence are also sending mixed signals. So organizations tend to be more divergent when the context itself is confusing. But then, still, that doesn't tell us what it means for organizational dynamics. The only way to understand it is to look into what is happening within the organization and what is happening with the leadership. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop, I'm just gonna say, strategic leader, leaders that have um, long-windedness, that they can see that they are off, working for a specific goal, but they know it will take them time. They are constrained by their own organizations. They cannot just make really big shifts in policy because they will lose their own organization. Those leaders are the ones that are, can push the organization incrementally forward. That. Thank you. <laughs>